Well, depending on where you are, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Welcome to the dental session of the 2020 Design of Medical Devices Conference. My name is Alex Falk, and I'm your host for the session. I'm from the School of Dentistry here at the University of uh, Minnesota, but I have a background in mechanical engineering, and my research interest is in the biomechanics of dental restorations. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank a few people, uh, Will Durfee and Art Erdman for inviting me to organize and host uh, this session, Fisher Johnson and Doug Miller for their assistance in putting this together, our sponsors for the support of this meeting, our speakers for kindly agreeing to present their work, and last but not least, our audience, uh, especially those from uh, overseas. Now, the devices market may be small compared to the entire medical devices market, but we're still talking about a business of one and a half billion in the United States and over $7 billion worldwide. The market is, is as the rate as the geriatric population grows and demands for aesthetic dentistry grow. Uh, dentistry is probably the most engineering discipline in the medical field. It is therefore not surprising that a lot of engineering tools are used here. Obvious examples are dental drills for removing carious tooth tissues, screws or implants for replacing missing teeth, braces and wires for orthodontics, uh, etc. Uh, with advances in digital, digital technologies and artificial intelligence, we will also see the emergence of a whole lot of digital smart gadgets for auto health monitoring, for the implanting, etc. You name it. Then covering in cardiology, prosthetics, and endodontics. All our speakers are experts or key opinion leaders in their respective fields. Each talk will last for about 20 minutes, and we will have a panel session at the end to allow our speakers to answer some of the questions that you may have. So feel free to send in your questions at any time using the Q&A function, and I will fill them on your behalf uh, at the panel session uh, after uh, all our speakers have spoken. So without further ado, let me introduce you to our first speaker, Dr. Alvin Wee. Dr. Wee obtained his dental degree from Creighton University, his MS degree in prosthodontics from the University of Iowa, and a clinical fellowship in maxillofacial prosthetics from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. While as a full-time faculty, he completed his uh, uh, master's in public health and PhD degrees. He joined the University of Minnesota last year, uh, 2019, September, and today he will talk about facial prosthesis. So over to you, Dr. Wee, and I would like to remind those who are not speaking uh, to uh, mute themselves and to, uh, um, to shut down the video. Thank you. All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Let me share my screen. All right, today we're gonna to talk about um, returning dignity to the facially deformed. <laughs> Maxofacial prosthodontist uh, uh, is a prosthodontist, which is uh, a specialty in dentistry, restoring uh, teeth and um, so forth. And uh, another year of training to become maxillofacial prosthodontist, where we restore facial parts and large uh, intraoral defects and also um, uh, dental oncology. And with maxillofacial prosthetics, we interact with patients with head and neck cancer um, craniofacial defects and also trauma. So what we're going to talk about today um, are the clinical and material concerns with regards to these facial prostheses, color, mechanical properties, retention, and some microbiological challenges. Facial prosthetics is not new. Uh, I was just listening to the soundtrack driving into the, the school, The Phantom of the Opera, uh, this is uh, a facial prosthesis at its uh, uh, lowest uh, uh, aesthetic level. How's that? So historically, um, 
facial, facial defects are caused by trauma, birth defects, cancer, self-inflicted gunshot wound, and also um, accidents. So historically, you can see that um, the, the wound site is not really uh, surgically enforced to um, hold the prosthesis. And they fabricated this prosthesis uh, 50 years ago with uh, acrylic and using of obviously the glasses to, to um, distract the viewer or the, the wild social interactions. <laughs> so the conceptual idea of facial prosthesis is not only the contour, texture, but the translucency and the color and everything in dentistry with regards to color, it has a polychromatic nature to it. It's not only one color, but you can see that different gradations and with silicone prosthesis, the problem with metamorphism is still there. We published this article in 2002 with regards to this patient where we would tint it differently and at the final delivery decide which is the more uh, appropriate prosthesis and also because with prosthesis, uh, the skin changes um, during the summer and the winter and providing the patient several prostheses with uh, different tans uh, might, be, um, might increase the quality of life of the patient. Some clinical problems, this is a patient uh, I saw with, uh, with a partial um, nasal, nasal defect at Nebraska. And what are the clinical problems? And this is a, a silicone facial prosthesis. And silicone is the current uh, state-of-the-art um, material to be used in facial prosthesis. It is, uh, it is, we have to remake it every one to two years. And this is not only a, a personal um, experience, but also documented in the literature. <laughs> Color is a problem with regards to UV lighting and um, how the color changes and degrades. Edge strength, you can see with this prosthesis, you need a thin edge so that it blends into the, uh, the skin and not um, a thicker edge that's obvious to the viewer. The tissue surface is a problem because it's moist and there's uh, infection and micro. Um, Canada accumulation as well. So we did a study, um, I was a consultant in this study done in Brazil. We assessed the treatment outcomes of facial prosthesis in patients with craniofacial defects. It was published in 2017. If you look at um, the variables, these are the variables that we looked at, sex, age, type of prosthesis, source of defect, retention, number of implants, uh, calculated the relative risk. And obviously, uh, as you know, if the relative risk is below one, it is um, protective. The risk of the outcome is decreased by the exposure. But if you look at the p-values, they're all above 0 0.05. So none of uh, the factors were really um, a contributing factor to uh, the survival of the prosthesis. But it could also be that um, the numbers are not high enough. So it's not, the, it's not powered enough. <laughs> if you look at the failures, a majority of uh, was color alteration was the most common reason for a new prosthesis. It was 23 out of 87, which is 27%. So let's talk about color. You know, in a book chapter I wrote in Rosenstiel's Contemporary Fixed Prosthesis, I created um, a schematic with regards to the flow of uh, the total color re replication process. This is the craniofacial structure, and you either shade match it with uh, viewing the shade and selecting the shade or color uh, analysis. Then it goes into a shade duplication phase whether you, are, whether you use a corresponding silicone with or without mixing, get the color of the facial prosthesis and surface stain. And we'll go through this as well. 
And with regards to um, measuring of color, you know, um, we use color instrumentation uh, to measure color, like a spectral radiometer, a colorimeter. But a lot of people don't realize that dental craniofacial structures are translucent. And as they are translucent, if you have uh, an aperture where the light and sensor is on this end of the aperture compared to this end of the aperture where the object is, you have the concept of edge loss. And edge loss not only decreases uh, the brightness of it, but it also changes non-uniformly the A star and B star values. That means it, the bottom line is it gives you wrong data that uh, cannot be transformed, all right? So the ideal um, configuration is without an aperture and you have a 45 degree illumination with um, zero degree observation. And in, in, a, in my lab, what we do is we illuminate the object um, with uh, a 45 degree illumination and then it's, we collect the reflectance data. <laughs> this is an example of the setup. Let's talk about uh, the color difference formula. If you have two objects in um, a three-dimensional space where um, L star is the brightness, the white and the black, and A star is the red green axis, and B star is the yellow blue axis, every um, point in this color space, um, you can get an L, A, and B value. And what happens is the difference between a CIE LAB or the 2000 formula or the CMC formula is the difference in the color difference corresponds to visual perceptibility and acceptability, which uh, we had one NIH grant about that. Um, if you have two points here, the color difference, which is less, shows a less color difference, the greater the distance between these two points, um, you would have a greater color difference. But with that comes, um, if the color difference is really small, you might be uh, at a non-perceptibility range. So there is a color difference, but you might not perceive it as, um, you can't visually see it. And in terms of clinical applicability, if the color difference, let's say, is greater than a certain amount, where it is in an acceptable range, you would see a color difference, but it's still clinically acceptable. There is a threshold where it's beyond a certain amount of color difference, it becomes unacceptable clinically. And we'll, we'll go through these with regards to prosthesis. So an example of, uh, we're using Rade's um, citation 2007, uh, 2009, above a three color difference for facial prosthesis. If you look at this silicone ear prosthesis, obviously you have, uh, you would feel that it's not clinically acceptable with regards to the color. This is our craniofacial implants uh, and we'll talk about this aspect of the clinical problem later. Uh, if you find, um, if you are at an acceptable range, what happens is there is a color difference, but it's socially um, rather acceptable. So if you look at this patient, there is a color difference, but with the glasses and the slight color change, this is socially acceptable for the silicone prosthesis. Or this VA patient that we treated in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, there is a color difference but it's still acceptable. Or this uh, silicone ear that is retained by adhesive, uh, that itself. So you get to a point where if the prosthesis uh, seems to be a good color difference, but if you look at this is acceptable for the patient. And for this, this, uh, this patient who has uh, really bonded with me, she has a squamous cell carcinoma of the 
the MAX3 sinus that express, but she also has a hole uh, at the palate. You know, if you look at, she sticks out her tongue here and we put an obturator, eventually a silicone prosthesis was fabricated for the patient. All right, so with regards to color, you can do chair side mixing, which uh, requires a lot of uh, artistic ability, or you could use visual shade tabs, similar to um, dental uh, shade tabs and uh, mix, uh, and uh, uh, looking at teeth. I could use uh, color measuring instrumentation. And this is an example of mixing it, mixing colors with silicone and trying to mix it and match it with the patient in the chair and then eventually tinting um, the molds and, fab and fabricating the silicone prosthesis with uh, a loss of wax technique. <laughs> then staining with regards to the patient. We measured the color of skin uh, in this uh, research study and eventually clustered uh, the skin color into five clusters. And we had five centroid groups. In another study, we proposed um, fabricating shade tabs for the patients. And these are the shade tabs that were fabricated for the patients. And in another study, we looked at uh, coverage error. So if you look at uh, the black and white, these are the color of the patient's uh, skin. And if you look at it in red, these are the color that's commercially available. And we're proposing to fabricate shade tabs for these skin colors in green. These are the centroids, which are more equally distributed around the, the color of the human skin. And this is using appropriate, very accurate uh, color measuring instrumentation. And look at that, with that as well. So with color uh, analysis and color mixing, uh, John Wolfart, who was just retired in Alberta, a good friend, and he used uh, a spectroradiometer and spectrophotometer but the problem with measuring a skin with this contact instrumentation is when you have skin contact, there's a color change. There's also edge loss and translucency of the skin cannot be captured uh, with regards to uh, the color matching. And obviously a problem of metamerism is still there. And we use a computerized color formulation to, to get the exact color mixing. And if you look at their studies, um, and this is, was published in 1996. <coughs> if you look at the first mixing, and we know that three is a trash hole, you know, you look at, they had to um, reiterate it two times to actually get it beyond that's uh, a color difference that's acceptable. So discoloration causes uh, replacement, yes, aesthetic concerns like this patient as well as a separate patient. Um, the pigments fade because of UV radiation from the sun. And if you look at the craniofacial implants and the bar, there is no hemidesmosome similar to um, dental implants. And so there's a lot of crusting and problems with regards to cleaning. And then we had to restain the prosthesis to an acceptable level. We tried uh, patterning. Uh, this is expired, but we wanted to coat the facial prosthesis uh, with a, a national team that um, I brought together when I was at Creighton. So since the previous pattern did not go through, we sort of created uh, a simulation and tested it in a lab with uh, atomic layering deposition with a resident um, from engineering at UIC and put a thin layer of uh, a thin layer of titanium oxide on the silicone and aged it. If you look at the silicones, then we put a thin layer of titanium oxide with ADL, and then uh, we looked at the color difference, which was 
3.4. So the, the thin layer of titanium oxide did uh, cause some uh, discoloration. And then if you look at the silicone that's aged without titanium oxide was 2.5. And if you had a titanium oxide <laughs> with the silicone and we aged it, it was 1.4. So it was protective with that titanium oxide ADL layer. But the problem is as you layer that thin layer of titanium oxide, there was a color difference as well. All right, we need to move on, uh, running out of time. <laughs> Mechanical properties is a problem. This is a patient I saw at um, the ENT department in uh, Nebraska. You know, the implants were placed, there are four zygoma implants we fabricated an overdenture and uh, four implants on the lower for fix. I didn't take uh, any pre-op radiograph, uh, pre-drop uh, uh, photos, but eventually you see that this gunshot wound patient, the whole upper lip is gone. Uh, we had to put um, a hole here so that he could breathe through his nose and put magnets. And eventually we put uh, a silicone facial prosthesis, fabricated a mustache for the patient and he was satisfied with. But with this, he found it hard to um, take out the prosthesis without damaging the edge. So edge strength is sort of important. In a study, we use paws to try to um, strengthen the edge strength, but it sort of um, could not find it. Ideally, it should be a reverse or an ideal pyramid. But you can see the more paws you put in from zero, um, the tensile strength actually decreases and the tear resistance maintained but didn't increase and eventually dropped off. So pause didn't work with regards to mixing these pause cages into the silicone. We did another study where we measured viscoelasticity of uh, human facial skin and uh, we're still <laughs> in a process of publishing the data at the VA. With regards to retention, um, adhesive is used. This is uh, acrylic nose or using the glasses. <laughs> for this patient, we used magnets that are in different planes for his obturator. This is actually, uh, there's a defect right into the palate, into the, 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 the face. So with regards to, you can retain it with uh, adhesive. There are a lot of problems with adhesive. I would not read it through, but if you look at the, the list, the list is rather, rather lengthy. So with that, starting the use of uh, dental or craniofacial implants in bone that have retention. Um, with that, that's a problem, but at least you can click in uh, and retain the facial prosthesis on the patient. Putting in a nose, we could put dental implants in a reverse, which we have done, or not in the gabella because uh, there's not enough bone, so the failure rate is rather high. And this is a patient we saw at the VA, or I treated, and we put reverse dental implants into the bone, eventually had a framework and then fabricate a siliconational prosthesis. Or the orbital defect, um, there's, there's a lot of cortical bone, so there's late uh, integration and failure. Example of some of the prosthesis. I know I hit 20 minutes, so let me just go through my slides really quickly. Soft tissue response is a problem with regards to there's no hemidesmosomes connection. And so trying to clean this area is really difficult. You know, there's hair follicles, sebaceous glands. You can see that tissue inflammation, if you rank it, auricular is the first because it's hard for the patient to clean around the, the framework of uh, around the year. Then comes orbital, the nasal is the easiest unless they have help with that. And the different designs for, for the framework. We also found that uh, craniofacial implants do have corrosion. 
and alkaline perspiration shows more uh, corrosive effects on these craniofacial implants. The last point is uh, microbial challenge. If you look at uh, Nina, who spent uh, a sandwich year in the Netherlands, uh, she looked at um, these microbials and these facial prostheses, either the, the microbial colonization uh, with or without uh, the prosthesis, and she also looked at candida. When you look at some of her data, this is uh, the prosthesis, silicone prosthesis side. This is the healthy side. There are definitely more bugs, aerobic bugs on the prosthesis side. Same as here, prosthesis side and healthy side, and candida as well. So it's quite obvious that these prosthesis causes. So the recommendation for in her, her subsequent PhD uh, study was that to use, compared to water, soap, essential oils, ethanol, to use chlorhexidine to rinse and clean the prosthesis um, every day. So in summary, we talked about the color, mechanical properties and retention, and some micro, microbiological um, challenges. Thank you. Sorry, I, I ran over a little bit. All right. Uh, thank you, Alvin. Uh, I was told by uh, Gary that my uh, introduction was a bit choppy, so I'm going to uh, keep my video off. Uh, just a reminder that we are going to have a panel session uh, at the end, so do send in your uh, questions uh, through the Q&A function. So, um, I'm going to introduce you to our next speaker, Dr. Pui Pin Chu. Dr. Chu is currently an associate professor with the Division of Biomaterials in the School of Dentistry here at the University of Minnesota. She obtained her Bachelor of Dental Surgery and later obtained her clinical fellowship in restorative dentistry from the Royal College of Surgeon, England. Her doctorate from the University of Manchester, UK is in diagnostics of dental erosion. Today, she will talk about optical devices, in particular, optical coherence tomography and their use for the diagnosis of dental caries. So over to you, Dr. Chu. Hello, everyone. Um, could you see, could you hear, see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, good. So um, I promise that my slides will not be as dramatic as uh, Alvin's. Um, um, we won't be seeing, we will only be looking at teeth. And um, so my, um, we will talk about the technologies that are um, currently available in terms of using it clinically for um, diagnosing dental dimerization. So what do we mean by dental dimerization? Dimerization of dental heart tissue um, can be produced either by uh, acid produced by bacteria or acid that is not produced by bacteria. For example, acid in your diet, in say in Coca-Cola, in orange juices, or acid that is regurgitated from your stomach, um, which is um, very, very acidic. So the presentations of the lesions that is produced by these types of um, different types of acids give rises to different lesions. Um, although the mechanism behind the demonization is still the dissolution of hydroxyapatite crystals um, on enamel and dentine, however, the macro presentation of these lesions are quite different. Um, so the lesions that's produced by organic acids produced by bacteria is what we, we know as caries or in lay terms, cavitation. And um, those produced or affected by acid not produced by bacteria are what we call erosion or erosive wear. So a little bit about um, the present presentation of um, these lesions. In terms of caries or ca cavities, um, as most of my patients would say, I would like to see whether I have cavitation or cavities in my mouth. So these are the presentations that we are very familiar with. 
The one on the left is the one on the occlusal surface or the surface that we use for chewing on the, uh, the back teeth. And the one on the right, uh, what we dental, dentists would call it smooth surface uh, lesions. Um, for example, this one on the canine and this one here on the lateral incisor. And these are quite <clears throat> big, frank cavitations that is not easily missed. In terms of erosion, um, the presentations of erosion is quite different from those of caries. For those of the um, caries, you could see that it's most of the time stained and um, there is a layer of soft, mushy material on the surface of the lesion, as opposed to erosion where it looks clean, um, there is no dental plaque, and there's hardly any staining. So it looks, so for example, this one on the lower, lower premolars, you could see very clearly dentine is already exposed. The superficial enamel has been eroded away and worn away. And what is obvious is dentine, which is clean with no, with no staining. And the reason being why there's no stain and why does it look clean is because um, the, ero the acid constantly wash away um, the surface and it's a relatively faster process compared to caries. Um, so what are the problems related to caries and erosion? With caries, um, such cavi big cavitated caries, we will have to restore the lesion, the, these lesions. And although um, modern restorative material, modern resin composite, uh, resin composite material or ceramic um, has increased the uh, longevity and the aesthetics of the restoration uh, incredibly, However, there's still um, reports of these restorations uh, failing um, in terms, for example, uh, fracture has, is very relatively common, commonly um, observed, and also defect, ma defect margins like this, and also staining around the restoration. And depending why these, why these occur, depending on fatigue, uh, on the loading, the occlusal loading of the patient, uh, whether the restoration was placed too high, whether, um, and also based on patient's caries risk profile. So as soon as a restoration is being placed on a cavitated lesion, then the teeth goes into this what we call a restoration cycle where a smaller cavity because a smaller restorations eventually may get carries around the restoration and then get replaced and becomes a bigger restoration and then somewhere down the line um, the rest the carries or this carries around the restoration gets extended into the um, root canal system and then root canal um, treatment is needed and so on and so forth. So ideally, we, we would like um, to not for the tooth to start having restoration and therefore going down this vicious cycle. In terms of erosive wear, um, the problems within um, erosive wear is, like, is also similar in terms of restoration, but it has also its own different uh, dif um, difficulties in, in, the, in the sense that there is other lesions, there, there are other wear processes that looks, that produces lesions that's similar to erosive wear. For example, these two, um, these two, lesions are uh, these two pictures at the top are erosive wear lesions but the two pictures at the bottom 
uh, due to ware processes that is not chemically uh, dominant and it's mainly due to attrition or mechanical wear. Uh, some, uh, many a times in the clinics, it's very hard to differentiate between a lesion that is predominantly um, due to erosive wear or predominantly due to a mechanical wear like attrition. So saying that, um, as we mentioned just now, as I mentioned just now, we would like if possible, not to have a tooth start getting into the vicious cycle of the restorative, um, restorative cycle. So if we are able to pick up caries way before, or we go back in time, if you will, to where it first started, back to the future where it's still not cavitated, it's just softening, there's just the beginning of demerization. If we're able to get back to that, you are able to detect these lesions right at the beginning, then we will be able to stop the teeth from getting into that vicious restorative cycle. So what are the possibility of being able to diagnose early lesions like this? Clinically, um, we dentists are traditionally using have traditionally used visual and radiography. Now, visual examination has lots of studies have done on looking into the sensitivity specific, specificity of visual um, examination of caries and especially of early caries and it's been shown that with very very um, strict training and with experience uh, visual ex visual diagnosis or detection of early lesions such as these can perhaps uh, can achieve a sensitivity of about 0.8 but specificity is quite low um, and the reported specificity is about between 0.6 to 0.8, depending on um, the different indices that's being used and the condition, uh, the situation where the examination was being conducted. In terms of radiography, it's not very, um, it's, it's well established that for early occlusal lesions, um, radiography is, uh, has very low specificity and sensitivity, but it has good um, sensitivity and specificity for proximal lesions, aproximal lesions in between teeth. So because of these um, limitations of the traditional or the um, usual manner of detect, uh, detecting early lesions, there's a now a plethora of uh, a plethora of um, different types of tools that's been used to try and supplement visual and radiography uh, detection. And those can be broadly categorized into optical and non-optical. And for today's um, presentation, I'm going to just concentrate on the optical methods. Within the optical methods, there are still, there are there are also different categories. So one big group is uh, based on the mechanism of quantifying the porosity on, of the teeth. So um, trans transelimination has been used, um, quantitative light induced fluorescence have been used, and optical currents tomography. So this is one big group. And another group is to use um, the presence of bacterial byproduct. Um, so these two commercially available system uses fluorescence to detect um, the byproduct of bacteria, uh, bacteria on the surface of the teeth. And it quantifies the amount. So the more the, more the intensity of fluorescence that comes back, um, based on laser or, or light 
Dynodent is a, a laser fluorescence and Superlife uses a blue light fluorescence. So these two basically um, quantify, so the more the byproduct, the more uh, the, the intensity of the fluorescence and therefore the higher uh, the chance that there is carriage. And then lastly, um, this one uh, other group that is uh, using photothermal changes uh, within the porosity to quantify or to determine the severity of the lesion. So what do we know so far? So um, in terms of validity, reliability, the performance of these um, systems in terms of validity, reliability, sensitivity, and specificity, uh, on the detection of carry, early carriage lesion, many studies have looked into uh, the performance of these uh, these optical me uh, optical meshes, and it has been shown that trans elimination OCT and the photothermal uh, system are the three systems that has got uh, relatively high both high sensitivity and specificity, good reliability, good validity uh, in terms of detecting just the, the detection of early lesions. However, if in terms of whether um, a system is able to determine whether the demorization, the severity of the demorization and the depth of the lesion, only OCT is able to um, not only be able to de detect the presence or absence of early carriage lesion, but it's also able to quantify the severity of the demorization and also the depth of the lesion, which will has implication on the uh, method or the way of uh, treating the early carriage lesion. So a little bit about uh, um, the basic of optical current tomography. Um, it is non-invasive because it's optical, um, obviously, and it gives cross-section as well as 3D imaging, uh, 3D images um, of, um, of uh, substrates, uh, scans such structures, and um, it's able to give relatively high resolution between five to five, uh, 15 microns axial resolution. Uh, it uses um, the, the near infrared light at, at about 1,300 nanometers. And it works, the mechanism of its work um, is similar to uh, ultrasound imaging, but it's, its resolution is higher than ultrasound, but the depth of penetration is um, much lesser. So it's been shown that small pores in carriage lesion behaves as scattering centers and strongly scattering this uh, near infrared uh, near infra light. And the scattering coefficient increases exponentially with increasing mineral loss. Natural and artificial demineralization increases the scattering by um, more than two orders of magnitude at this particular wavelength. So because of all these base um, background um, studies that have been done quite many years ago, so we are able to then use it to um, validate it on the detection of early caries, uh, early fissure caries. So this is a cross section um, along this path along this path on this tooth and you could see um, validated against polarized microscopy you could see that there is very little scattering um, on the OT OCT scan. Another cross-section along this path where there is a early lesion we could see that um, there is increased backscatter along the slope of the fissure and along the wall of the fissure. And we've tried to try, uh, tried and validating the measurement of depth of early fissure carries against polarized microscopy. We have found that um, on the slope lesions, OCT height measurements were statistically bigger 
or yeah, bigger than the polarized light microscopy. However, it's only about the bigger, the, the range of it being bigger is about less than 0.1 millimeter. And, um, and there's no constant bias with, because, uh, uh, in this difference. And because it's less than 0.1 millimeter, it's not, we, we deemed it as not clinically significant. However, for the wall loca for the wall lesions, OCT height measurement um, was statistically smaller, much smaller, about 0.6 millimeters smaller than those measured by uh, microscopy. And there's also a presence of proportionate bias. So with this, we concluded that for fissure caries, for early fissure caries, OCT is reliable um, when used to measure the slope lesions of the fissure caries, but not so for the wall lesions. And in terms of severity of demerization, this is a depth profile, intensity depth profile of the lesions. And for a sound lesion, this is typically the uh, pattern of intensity depth profile that we get um, where there is a high, a very high peak at the interface, and then the light attenuates very quickly. For early lesions like this, where it's um, where there's just this porosity, we have lower peak, but then a wider area where there is increased demerization. And for ICDAS2, which is a slightly more severe than ICDAS1, there is a bigger um, area under the curve. And we've also managed to try, and in terms of severity of demoralization, we tried to map it against uh, SEM, and we have able to uh, prove that this, is, um, this has been presented in IDR last year, where Interproximal, uh, interprismatic demerization were correlated to a specific range of intensity uh, of OCT, and there is significant difference in terms of the interprismatic demerization OCT um, intensity um, against inter and intraprismatic demerization, where there is increase in intensity in the OCT backscatter. And lastly, just to look at, we have also used it to look at carries around restoration. So this is a, a top view of the OCT scan of this leash of this restoration. And um, the cross section, we could see the wall and the floor of the restoration. And we could quantify the carries at the right at the margin of the restoration and also any interfacial gap at the wall of the lesion of the restoration and on over not only we can get b scans or 2d images like this we were also able to very quickly um, gather a 3d image like this where you could see the wall of the lesion of the restoration, the floor of the restoration, and you could see uh, in this instance increased intensity at the floor of the restoration and some um, porosity in the restoration. And we are currently um, we are currently planning for a clinical trial with um, OCT to look at carries around restoration. Sorry, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chu. Right. Um, <clears throat> uh, just a reminder, we're going to have a panel session at the end uh, of this session. So do send in your questions through the Q&A function. Um, I'm going to introduce you to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Mozat Kapoor. Dr. Kapoor was born and raised in Tehran. Iran, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree from the Sharif University of Technology. He then moved to the United States, where he earned his Master and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Minnesota and the University of California, respectively. 
He is a fluid dynamicist. Uh, Dr. Kapoor joined Sonendo in 2008, where he developed the gentle wave technology, and he currently serves as the Vice President of Research and Development of Sonendo. Today, he will tell us about uh, the gentle wave system and its use for endodontics. So over to you, Dr. Kapoor. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, I think uh, it's an honor to be uh, on this presentation. Let me start with the first slide, which is Go Gophers. I graduated from University of Minnesota. It was about 15 years ago, and um, I've been in California ever since, since 2005, but I still consider myself a Minnesotan. So it's great to present to University of Minnesota. Uh, when I graduated, well, I was looking for opportunities where I could actually bring research into um, real applications, um, uh, very similar to the works that were presented uh, before me. So I decided, instead of academic route, however, uh, to join a, an incubator called Fjord Ventures, as you can imagine, run by a Norwegian family. All they do is to look for opportunities in medical device field. And um, they go after disruptive technologies. They are not looking for uh, incremental changes. And uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go over these, but I'm showing these names. It will be fun to do a little bit of research about some of these companies and the products that they have uh, produced. They have pretty much changed the way things are done uh, in, in their respective fields. And the rule of thumb in Fjord Ventures is that you have to think outside the box, right? So you can't, if you continuously look at the way things are done, you come up with incremental improvement. So you have to look at it from a different lens and try to come up with a completely different way of uh, doing things. With regard to Sonendo, we decided to go after dentistry. Of course, there is a lot of opportunities in dentistry, lots of good improvements, but if you look at them, mostly they are incremental improvements, improvements to the existing uh, way of basically treating dental diseases. Um, first thing we did was to really try to understand, and none of us, I mean, I'm talking about only a couple of people, but none of us was really a dentist. So as engineers, we're trying to learn, you know, what is the dental universe look like? And we summarize it, as you can see on this slide. Uh, dental universe, uh, in our opinion, is all about either moving teeth, that is orthodontics, replacing te teeth, that is uh, basically implantology and prosthodontics, and um, saving teeth, which is really the restorative and also the endodontic side of um, um, uh, dentistry. And uh, if you look at the disease model, uh, first you try to use all the equipments at home to keep your teeth clean and prevent the carious lesions that uh, Dr. Chu uh, presented on. Um, you know, we uh, pay a visit to dental office to get professional cleaning um, to further ensure that you know, none of those early stage caries are developing. Um, but, you know, it's just a matter of time that some of those cavities form and then we uh, receive a basically cavity cleaning or a restorative procedure. If we don't do that, we're going to get a, a basically infection inside the tooth that will require a root canal therapy. And in some cases, the tooth is a goner and it needs to be replaced. So really, if you look at it, this is uh, what the progression looks like. We decided to focus on uh, root canal therapy and start from there and then work our way down towards uh, the other sides of uh, dentistry, including cavity cleaning. If you look at the tooth decay, it's one of, it's actually the most prevalent disease. Uh, billions and billions of dollars are, sp are spent uh, every year on dealing with um, uh, basically tooth decay. The problem of tooth decay is uh, really the infection as we spoke. The bacteria gets through enamel, which is the most difficult part, and then once it gets into dentin, it's pretty easy for it to uh, expand and grow and eventually reach the pulp, and it infects the pulp of the tooth. And uh, after that, the abscess forms and lesions form and, um, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. So um, the whole 
focus here is to uh, basically clean and disinfect um, um, the, basically the tooth. If you look at endodontics specifically, the way it's done and it's represented with uh, what's called endodontic triad is shaping, debridement and disinfection and obturation. Uh, in, in other terms, they take instruments, solid instruments like an endodontic file, and they uh, file the inside of the root canals, and then uh, they have some solutions that they put inside the root canal to disinfect and dissolve tissue and fill the tooth. Um, if you look a little bit closer at the market and also the technologies available, there are many, many different types of files uh, and many different types of obturation materials. So these are two saturated markets. And interestingly, the two uh, saturated markets are not the focus of endodontics. Endodontics, the blue uh, uh, bubble, uh, is all about the Brightman and disinfection, and that seemingly is receiving the least amount of attention from industry. So that's how we realized that there is an opportunity. And at the same time, you look at the outcomes, um, it's arguably anywhere between 20 to 30% failure rate, depending on how the study outcome, uh, outcome study has been uh, designed and performed. And um, in general, there is a need for um, a better debridement and disinfection with higher success rate, uh, less post-op pain, and less removal of dentin uh, material in the market. So being engineers, you know, we, we dream sometimes, right? So we, we thought about what if, what if there was a day that we could debridement and disinfect the inside of the tooth, the root canal system, without removing any dentin, without really sacrificing the structural integrity of the tooth, and then obturate that natural anatomy, whatever it is. Unpredictable, yes, but whatever it is can be obturated um, and without necessarily having to remove dentin and, and compromise the strength of the tooth. So uh, I've, I've skipped some slides. This is a longer presentation, but uh, in, uh, at the end, what we put together was a technology that combines uh, three um, main, uh, basically, uh, phenomena or, or uh, aspects of uh, the device. One is fluid dynamics, which is really my background. The other one is sound or acoustics, and uh, the last is chemistry. Our innovation was more focused around fluid dynamics and sound, not so much chemistry. So we decided, at, le at least at the beginning, to use the same uh, chemistry um, as, it, as basically it's used now, but focus on uh, how we can energize that fluid and how we can get the most out of that solution that we are delivering to achieve uh, higher outcomes. So we decided to uh, design this device that you see. Um, just quickly, I'm sorry. So in this video, what you're seeing is really a stream of fluid that's generated by the system. It's coming down, as you see in the white arrows, uh, and it reaches this bottom portion um, uh, of that uh, tube. Uh, and on the right image, you're seeing that that high-speed stream of fluid is interacting with the stagnant fluid that's accumulated inside the pulp chamber of the tooth. And what you're observing is really hydrodynamic cavitation. It's a continuous hydrodynamic cavitation cloud that's generated, uh, and that's really the source of uh, sound energy, uh, per se. Uh, that, uh, that, that basically delivers all these shock waves and, and acoustic waves and propagates inside the fluid that's accumulated inside the tooth. Um, with regard to fluid dynamics, uh, more specifically, this is the same stream of fluid that we looked at, the yellow arrow that's coming down, same uh, window that you were looking at that was creating the cavitation cloud, and it hits a plate at the bottom of that tube and it deflects and it deflects upward. Um, I'm assuming that some of at least the attendees are engineers. Uh, for those, it's really not a, um, a really big thing to uh, hear about. Yes, we are using the flow over a cavity phenomena. 
to generate vortical flow inside the root canal system. And also by dialing the angulation of this uh, deflection, deflected flow, we are able to uh, generate negative pressure inside the root canal system. Again, it's simply a flow over a cavity. Um, and, and what it does is to generate vortical fluid uh, dynamics and also a negative pressure inside the root canal system. So we started putting that together, but uh, we were sometimes not cleaning teeth and we couldn't figure out exactly why. So we did some flow visualization that's uh, very commonly done in fluid dynamics. And what we saw and you're observing in this video is, uh, do you really see this big bubble is sitting at this junction and preventing all the energy and fresh chemicals that are supposed to reach the, uh, the area, uh, the apical area of the root canal? Um, so we said, okay, this is not really uh, feasible. We need to take care of this bubble. If you look at endodontic products uh, to deal with this problem, a uh, majority have tried to take the chemical route, which is adding a surfactant and therefore somehow dealing with this bubble. So what we said is, uh, what if we implement uh, components inside our system? This is the console, the picture of the console that you're seeing. And uh, at the end of this hose, you can see the, um, basically the, uh, the consumable or the handpiece. Uh, so inside the console, we put components called degassers. Uh, uh, again, they're off-the-shelf components. We put them to uh, take the dissolved gas out of the fluid. Uh, and on top of it, we uh, developed a protocol for endodontists to create a sealed environment so that no air can get into the root canal system. And as a result, uh, we got what you're seeing in this video. Initially, there is some air in the system. But as time progresses, you will see that the number and the size of the bubbles goes down and eventually they disappear. And right now, uh, the device is still running, but you don't see any more bubbles. And that's exactly what we want because now we are having all those fem uh, fresh chemicals and also um, the sound energy reaching the entire root canal system. So, Taking a look at a few fun uh, videos here. This is real time displacement of the dye. As you can see, no instrument is inserted into the root canal system. At the tip of the instrument is sitting on top of the tooth uh, in the pulp chamber area. And it's remotely really delivering fluid uh, and, and replacing the dye. Um, and while generating a negative pressure. In the second video, the one in the middle, uh, the, the one on the right, uh, what you're seeing is a much heavier and thicker fluid that's more difficult uh, to, to remove. And uh, we, wa we wanted to do that to further visualize how the fluid dynamics uh, works and how the entire system basically works. As you can see, you see the generation of the vortices inside the root canal system. It's uh, worth mentioning that the apical portion of this video that you're watching right now is around uh, 150 microns. So it's pretty small. And as you can see, um, it took a few seconds more than the other video, but uh, eventually the uh, thicker dye was displaced completely. Now you might wonder, okay, what's happening inside the, uh, the root canal? taking a closer look. So flow visualization again, putting some uh, very fine silica powder uh, inside the fluid and running the device to see what's really happening. You see a lot of movement, you see a lot of uh, wall shear stress, and that's exactly what we want to deal with biofilm, to deal with uh, basically the infection that's sitting on the surface of the root canal system. So this video, again, was done just to compare uh, how the two devices uh, compare, uh, basically operate. Uh, on the left side, you're seeing the tip of an ultrasonic device that's used to activate fluid. And on the right side, you see the tip of the uh, Genowave uh, system instrument. 
the two solu the, the two pieces of tissue of equal weight and relative size um, are exposed to three percent sodium hypochlorite continuous flow, and you see a completely uh, different speed of dissolution, uh, which is really talking about the physics because between these two videos we have kept chemistry constant. So it is really speaking about how much you can gain by optimizing the physics. Um, without necessarily having to increase the concentration of the solutions that, that you're using or adding time, right? So the uh, tissue on the right side is uh, almost completely um, dissolved in about a minute and some change, whereas the tissue on the left side keeps fizzing and it could go on for hours. So to this date, uh, we have done about 500,000 procedures. So uh, while it's still called a new device, which is very surprising because uh, in many industries when you have that many procedures and when you have uh, many years of uh, work, uh, you're not necessarily called a new device, but five years into commercialization of half a million uh, patients have received the procedure by about 600 clinicians in North America. This is where we are now. Um, and um, one of the things that uh, you may ask at this point is, okay, so you have a cleaning device and uh, what is next really uh, in, in the journey of Sanendo and where we are going? Uh, we want to continue optimizing our system uh, and eventually by the end of this year, we uh, will be cleaning teeth without even entering the tooth. So the device basically, even the tip of the device will not enter the tooth. All you need to do is to create an axis on top of the tooth, an ax endodontic axis opening, and the device sits on top of that axis without even entering the pulp chamber, and it will clean the entire root canal system. That's our first goal. The second is to obturate the natural anatomy of the root canal system, um, and that is, um, that has been the goal, as I mentioned in the beginning of, of the presentation. Um, we want to eliminate the use of files and removal of dentin, and therefore preserve the integrity of the root. I'm so glad to see that Dr. Shu uh, and her team are working on uh, early uh, caries detection. Uh, we are working on cleaning and disinfection of carious lesions. And um, we are focused more on uh, ICDS-1 and 2 um, early stage caries at this point. So just showing some videos on what I mean by filling uh, teeth that are not shaped. This video is an example of it, of course, for visualization purposes. This is a plastic tooth, but made based on real anatomy of a tooth. Uh, we use the same fluid dynamics and the same basically mechanism of action to deliver a material that we have developed uh, for basically filling teeth. We have a materials group uh, at Sanendo and we are developing this material uh, that flows like water, but then it's, it turns into solid. Um, that requires no shaping. You can fill the natural anatomy of the tooth and you can fill the teeth literally in a few seconds as you saw in that video. And these are some cross sections of uh, the root canals built with that uh, material and, and our, uh, our system, basically. While the picture shows really large carious lesion, just for the sake of showing, uh, our focus on cleaning caries remains on early, early stage caries, more like a preventative rather than a restorative um, um, procedure. And that would be all. Thank you, Alex. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Merzat. Uh, we have seen uh, dental devices that help prevent oral diseases, uh, restore the functions of diseased teeth, and most of all, devices that can bring quality of life and dignity back to patients uh, in need. Uh, thank you, uh, all our speakers, uh, for their very interesting and informative talks. And it's interesting to see that uh, there will be probably more interface between um, 
engineers and dentists uh, to help bring uh, more dental devices or products uh, to benefit patients in need. So we are now in our panel uh, sessions and we do have a few questions uh, coming in. Um, okay. Right, I have one from City Maria, who's from Malaysia. So, thank you for the great presentations. Um, so she has a question on the application of OCT in the field of prosthodontics. Uh, they will report on the ability of OCT to get fractures, however, with li limitation of the signal attenuation. Can the near infrared light from OCT able to penetrate different substrate, as example ceramics or metal, to scan and give information underneath fixed prosthesis? Hi, 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 Siti. Thank you very much for the uh, uh, questions. So unfortunately, OCT hasn't got that uh, penetration ability to go through uh, ceramic or metal. Um, with Emacs, with the Emacs material, there is a possibility that it could penetrate um, somewhat, but in, if we are looking at using OCT to um, look at substructure uh, structures underneath the restorations then um, it would not be possible but if we are looking using OCT to look at the wall or the interface between ceramic um, and the tooth or between Emacs and the tooth that it's it is possible and we have um, some preliminary data on that um, however, metal scatters the NI, uh, near infrared light too much, so it produces too much um, noise um, to be able to decide or to be able to discern the interface between metal and tooth properly. Uh, City has a second question uh, regarding the reading reproducibility of an operator using OCT. Is it easy to standardize or does it require a learning curve for the operator? Yeah, so um, we have published um, something on that and um, we have found that the reproducibility of, of using OCT B-scan as, as how you would using it as like a radiograph, uh, the reproducibility is very high. I think it, I remember from the top of my head, the um, reproducibility was around 0.9 to 0.8 to 0.9. Um, but that is with one condition that we have um, criteria for uh, diagnosis clearly, clearly described. Okay, we yeah. have a question for Dr. Wee. Uh, from Bruna Tonin, I think she's from Brazil. The most of prosthesis presented are made with silicon. What do you think about the maxillofacial prosthesis made by acrylic and resin? Have you seen the difference of color durability or clinically long survival between prosthesis made by silicon or resin acrylic? Alvin? You're muted. Okay, let me unmute. Sorry. I'm trying to find the... So I have, um, in my 25 years, seen one um, acrylic prosthesis that we fabricated during a fellowship year. And I think those are, they seem to be more color stable. There's no question. You know, the question is, um, they're not flexible and it's uncomfortable for the patient. So that, that's a concern. So the whole industry has moved away from uh, acrylic to, uh, to silicone prosthesis. Right. Even though it's more color, it might be more color stable, um, it, it is not as comfortable for the patient as uh, we would like. 
I hope like, um, that answers your question. Okay, well, what about color durability and uh, survivability? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree that color stability is seemed to be better with uh, acrylic compared to silicones and survivability as well. It's just that, um, you know, it's not comfortable for the patient to wear it, right? Definitely, they're, they're more stable and more, they last longer. Okay. Uh, we have another question for uh, Alvin from Deepak Gupta. Uh, do maxillofacial and craniofacial defects have regeneration potential? Can we use osteoinductive or osteoconductive bioresorbable polymeric implants to regenerate lost bone in maxillofacial cavities? Well, I think tissue engineering is uh, a huge future of maxillofacial research, right? I mean, recently, uh, not recently, the last few decades is more free flaps, you know, removing moving tissue, bone, um, blood vessels into the defect side and, and making it viable. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of research with regards to tissue engineering and uh, there's a lot of potential. <coughs> and to my understanding, uh, it is not at that stage right now. The research seemed to be in uh, immediate rehab and uh, still with regards to uh, free flap transfers. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential with regards to tissue engineering. So um, it's something exciting to watch on. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we have a questions for uh, Mozart from David Nedro. Uh, one of our local labs here. Do you apply cycles of positive pressure in addition to negative pressure through the Sonendo device? Uh, not really. It's uh, as soon as the device starts operating, it generates the negative pressure due to um, the flow over the cavity. Uh, so there are no cycles of positive pressure. The fluid, if the question is around how does then the fluid penetrate into the root canal system, it basically, um, because of generation of uh, negative pressure, it automatically is drawn into the canal. And uh, I wish I could replay some of those videos or we can talk later uh, to show that the fluid is drawn into the canal and it fills the space uh, pretty quickly. So the tooth doesn't even need to be pre-filled. I hope I answered the question. I hope so too, thank you. Um, Here's another question for Mozart uh, from Don Peterson. Is the fluid flow uh, in turbulent or laminar flow modes and how significant is the boundary layer? Oh. So uh, the fluid is actually, uh, this is coming from mechanical engineering, I can tell. <laughs> uh, the fluid is actually very turbulent and as you would expect it has a it is one of the main things that we are working on especially in this new design um, that we are working on um, it is uh, imperative to have a turbulent flow and avoid any type of uh, laminar flow that um, that's basically a steady state laminar flow uh, what i'm trying to create in this new design is a turbulent flow. So spot on, yes, uh, it has to be turbulent. And the significance of boundary layer, um, it, it's again, very good question. It is very important. For instance, um, it, the, if you talk to 10 endodontists, you come up with 12 ways of uh, creating the endodontic axis. And that is the basically the hole on top of the tooth where they reach the pulp, right? So um, that is probably one of the biggest uh, boundary uh, conditions that we are uh, dealing with. Uh, with regard to the boundary layer, as in boundary layer in turbulent flow, um, I can't have that, uh, I can't answer that question as I don't have enough uh, experiments done on that but uh, that will be uh, something uh, that we can look at maybe. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question uh, may kickstart some collaborations between Dr. Chu and Dr. Wee. Can OCT 
penetrate to measure maxillofacial silicon to measure prosthesis adaptability and thickness. Um, I guess it's for Dr. Chu. Very good question, Fasrina. And uh, I think um, so. We it, it all depends again on the thickness of the silicon and um, if and also the refractive index of the silicon. So if the uh, refractive index of silicon is that's used for maxillofacial prosthesis is very similar to skin. Um, definitely the penetration would probably at least reach up to between one to two millimeters. Um, is that what, um, is that the thickness that's normally? Um, no, it's happening? usually the thickness of centimeters, you know. Mm. Like half a centimeter, one centimeter, two centimeters, uh, mm. one millimeter. Well, we can perhaps um, use um, refractive index um, matching medium to try and increase the penetration depth. So yeah, we could look into that actually. Yeah, that's exciting. Another question for uh, Dr. Wee. Do you have any experience providing CAT CAM extra oral prosthesis made with silicone? I think that that is currently the state of the art, right? Um, the scanning and uh, I haven't had the experience doing it. You know, I've uh, reviewed articles that uh, they're doing printing, scanning, then uh, digital design and eventually printing silicones uh, is still at the preliminary stage where I think there are certain um, authors and centers that have printed and uh, Everybody's assessing the long-term durability, uh, but I haven't had experience doing it. Okay. Um, I think we have time for another couple of questions for Mozart. Uh, this is from Fei Lin, uh, one of our former visiting scholars from Beijing, China. Uh, she has a question about the procedure setup of Gentle Wave. She noticed that in most of your procedures, the running time for EDTA is two minutes with a flow rate of 45 milliliter per minute. This means that it would be 90 milliliter EDTA running into the canals for each tube. But clinically, we don't often use that much of EDTA solution. So what's your uh, view on that, Mozart? So first of all, we dilute the um, solutions. The system takes the, um, basically the input solutions reads the concentration and dilutes them down. So what we are using it has a lower concentration than what is normally used in endodontics. As an example, uh, sodium hypochlorite, what we are using is 3% and we are very soon going down to lower concentrations, whereas in endodontics is commonly somewhere between six to 8%. Uh, same for EDTA, we are uh, lowering the concentration. So that's important to consider. With regard to uh, the time, uh, it was one of the concerns of one of our scientific advisors, uh, Dr. Haposalo, and he did a study actually, uh, he did a um, uh, study uh, using uh, EDX to uh, look at the dent integrity of dentin and see whether or not there is erosion. And what he found, and it is published in Journal of Endodontics, what he found is that the dentin integrity is actually very close to the uh, natural dentin uh, that hasn't seen any, any chemicals. So um, it was a concern, but uh, the research has shown that it is not. Okay, the next question and final question is also for uh, Mozart. Uh, I don't know whether you can answer this, but it's from Fei again. You mentioned some novel obturation material. Uh, can you tell us what it is? Unfortunately not, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> sorry for, to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll so find out in due, in due course, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, I think uh, that's all the questions we have. Well, thank you again for all our speakers for their wonderful uh, lectures. Uh, I can see some collaborations happening uh, very soon. And thank you uh, for your attendance, uh, especially those from overseas. I hope you have enjoyed the lectures. And uh, these are all taped, uh, recorded. So if you miss 
any parts of the presentations, uh, you will have the opportunity to come back and watch it again. All right, that's all from us. Thank you and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.